The best farmhouses are celebrated for their warm, inviting ambiance and timeless rustic charm. Today on Homeworthy, we're exploring three distinct farmhouses, a Long Island cottage exuding relaxed elegance, a Hudson Valley farmhouse set on a former Christmas tree farm, and an eclectic Victorian farmhouse in Bellport, New York. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Before today's episode, click the join button below to support all of the storytelling we do on this channel. Our growing community of members help to directly fund more videos so we can capture these extraordinary homes from around the world. So join today to receive early and exclusive access to new Homeworthy videos. Today on Homeworthy, we're visiting a beautiful 1920s farmhouse on the north shore of Long Island, where we'll meet designer Claire Fleming Peters and her husband Paul Peters, who just so happens to be the mayor of their town of Roslyn Estates. Claire is a graduate of Parsons School of Design and has worked for both Timothy Whalen and Bunny Williams before launching her own design firm, Fleming Peters. After a long restoration, Claire has decorated her family's antique-filled home with a breezy elegance and a welcoming sense of comfort. Enjoy! You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. To shop items inspired by this and other Homeworthy episodes, be sure to check out the product links below for amazing furniture, accessories, and more. Hi, Homeworthy. I'm Claire. And I'm Paul. Welcome to our farmhouse on Long Island. Come on in. Hi, I'm Claire Fleming Peters. And I'm Paul Peters. Welcome to our home. You are in Roslyn on the North Shore of Long Island, and this is our 1926 farmhouse. So I'm a California native. I'm from Santa Barbara, California originally. I moved to New York to go back to school. I wanted, I'd always wanted to be a designer since I could remember. I would lay in bed at night and I would redecorate my piano teacher's living room in my head. <laughs> And I loved her, but she didn't care about what her house looked like. And so I would think about that. And, and just, it never went away. So finally in my 30s, I thought, well, it's now or never. So I applied to Parsons and I met Bunny Williams and she invited me to New York to work for her. And that was 24 years ago, 23 years ago. And then I worked for her and then I worked for Timothy Whalen, which was another great A-level designer. And then I met Paul and we met online. eHarmony was our, was our, um, how we met yes and we communicated by by just writing back and forth like two or three months just it, and i loved that he was funny and he knew how to spell <laughs> a lot of That's people important. don't spelling He's is like important. my name was spelled right immediately um and then we got married a couple of years later and then we made a blended family and then we made this home so it's a labor of love for us our son jamie used to say that if anybody asks how we met she, she claire should say that we were both skydiving and her chute didn't open and That's I right. saved her. That's right. But we didn't. We met but on We've never harmony. floated that no, story we, for the, real. Nobody <laughs> ever believed it anyway. This is a 1926 farmhouse. We both have strong design aesthetics. We both can draw. We both. So one of the things we did was we divided up the house so that there are certain rooms that Paul was responsible. He, you know, his music room is his color. It's his style. It's, he let me decorate a lot of it, but it was with him in mind. Then other rooms were mine. He, he thinks I got all the good rooms, and I probably did. <laughs> so, but anyway. I did get the garage. He got the garage, he got the basement, he got his office. Uh, but yeah, I think that's probably true in a lot of, a lot of couples. But so I, so I was in charge of rugs, textiles, color, um, concept. And then he so kindly, well, you, I'll show you on our tour, but there's some really special pieces that he bought me for milestone birthdays. And so that was sort of, I designed around pieces and colors that I love. Um, and I think we ended up with, I don't know, kind of a Northern European farmhouse, if I had to assign anything to it. 
but it developed piece by piece by piece. But, but for me, the underlying thing was peace and like an exquisite comfort. So there's down everywhere. I, I learned later that's terrible for the geese. So now I'm looking into some, some, um, some types of down that aren't genuine article. But um, so everything feels good. The rugs feel good on your feet. But uh, whenever I'm so happy when I come in here and Adam who's 6'1 is stretched out on the sofa with, he's like, these are dreamy, I love it here. Because it feels good and there's like a depth of comfort that was important to me and I hope that it's gone throughout the house. So welcome to our foyer. This is the beginning of the story of the farmhouse. And the initial idea was to feel as though the outside gardens came in and swept through and went out the back door. That was the idea. But to soften it, we added an antique Ushak rug. And this, this clock is Dutch. I'm sort of a sucker for Northern European antiques. You're gonna see a few more of them as we go through the house. So I really particularly love this. It's been scraped down. It's not the original color, but I like it better that way. It's Dutch, if I didn't say that, from the 1860s. Then something else I really have invested in from the beginning is professional photography with our family. And this is Paul and me with our beautiful mare, Smooth as Brandy. And I, it, we used it for one of our Christmas cards and I wanted it to look like it was snow, but we didn't have snow, so the photographer made it look as light as possible to give the impression of snow. In terms of like an overall design concept, I wanted it light and I wanted it to feel like nature. Um, so a Faro and Ball is my go-to for color. So this is, these walls are ammonite, so it's sort of all like a play on, and I'm from California, right? So it's, there's an English country, Northern European farmhouse feel, but also with California, hopefully freshness and colors of the sea and the sky and the sand. These flowers are from our garden. And I did them this morning because I couldn't find the branches that I wanted for this. So I just went out and a dear friend of mine always said, go and see what's blooming. It automatically goes together. So that's what I did. This table is from John Darian, which is one of my favorite shops down on 2nd and 2nd in New York City. Um, and these are some of my favorite design books. David Adler is one of my heroes in country houses. And that's what this is all about. And my, my mentor, Timothy, I had two, Timothy Whalen and Bunny Williams. And this was one of Tim's favorite. And he even did a house by David Adler in the Midwest. So it kind of always reminds me of him. And Bunny always taught me, for example, flowers from the garden, not from a florist. She, every time she gave a party, there was always a place to sit. There was always the same caterer that you knew by name. So she cared very much about beauty, but she also made sure that every chair had a table, a drinks table, and a light. And I hope that you'll see her influence as you move through the house. We need to have Paul here because so much of this living room would never have happened, and the foyer without him. So here, I here am. he is. Okay. Uh, I, I, the most important thing is that these rooms existed, but Claire changed them. She, for example, there used to be bookcases on either side of the fireplace, and she had them taken out so we could get more light into the room. Claire loves it when bringing the outside of the, uh, of the home into the, into the, the uh, rooms. Uh, the fireplace originally consisted of just this little central part. That's all it was. We wanted a bigger, appearing fireplace, and Claire found a, a photo of an Irish cottage, right, honey? Yeah, uh, with Robert this, Kimes with cottage. This, okay, with this mantle. So uh, I drew it up to uh, duplicate it. And we had a, a, our uh, woodworker make it and have the uh, guy who paints for us uh, make it look old. And then we d um, designed the, uh, the brick facade to make it look larger without actually enlarging the firebox. The cane is uh, a tribute to a movie called The Miracle on 34th Street. Uh, about a man who claimed to be Chris K Kringle. The final shot, the final scene was filmed nearby, about three or four miles from here at a house in Salem in Port Washington. It's still there. And at the end, little Natalie Wood, who played the, uh, the, the daughter, and Maureen O'Sullivan and uh, John Payne, the two uh, grown-ups in the scene, they thought they had done this wonderful thing in finding this home for, and then there was Chris Kringle's cane by the fireplace. So that's why that cane is there. That's exactly the same wooden cane, exactly like the one he used. 
So even though I'm a trained designer and I've been 20 years in the industry and a graduate of Parsons, you know, when it's your own house, it, I felt my way through it. I did know that I wanted it to feel deeply comfortable and relaxed and also elegant. And I had some beautiful antiques to start with. One of them is this Swedish secretary. It's a Gustavian secretary that I bought in Bridgehampton from Lauren Copen Antiques. And this was a milestone birthday gift from Paul. And our little niece, Sasha, there's lots of drawers and things inside. And she has all of her very special treasures in those little drawers. So I felt, then I fell in love with this rug. And it's my favorite rug guy in the world, Josh from Rug and Kill Him, who I used to always present his rugs to clients and they may, they may or may not have understood the lightness and the whimsy and the Moroccan feel, but I always want it. So as soon as we had a chance, he came in and this is one of his rugs and I fell madly in love with it. So that was, became the color palette. And I thought, can I have all these blues or not? But you can. So this is Skylight from Pharaoh and Ball. And then this is his rug. And then this is another kind of prize piece. This is an 18th century uh, bench Swedish from Leaf Antiques in Los Angeles that we bought sight unseen and had it sent here. And when it arrived and I unwrapped it with the plastic, I was dying. It was so exactly what we wanted because it's under the window. It doesn't interfere with the light once again. It provides extra seating and a seating group. So we have English chair, English chair. This is from How Antiques in London, is my, one of my other favorite places. Um, my sister-in-law and I went to their warehouse sale in Battersea, London. And so Christopher Howe and I worked on this together. This is antique linen. And then we have another seating group on this side, which is two Regency sofas that uh, Paul drew for me so that we could uh, have a matching pair. So this chest, is I wanted it to feel obviously like a farmhouse because that's what it is. And this chest I thought was really beautiful and I found it on first dibs. It's an Amish chest from Pennsylvania. Again, from I think 19th century, 1840s, something like that. So we plopped it here in front of the Gustavian bench with the English chairs. And then we have a portrait that Paul's least favorite piece is a portrait that was a gift from my Uncle Marty in Minnesota. But I insisted that we have a portrait in the living room, so he very nicely agreed. And then this little uh, round piece is uh, also from Howlett, London. Well, I was going to say, don't you think he looks constipated? <laughs> it, what a sourpuss. God. Uh, Claire, why do you love it? I, I, my scheme is black and pale blue and gold in this room. That's enough for me. And it's a family piece and it's an oil portrait. From and Uncle I didn't Mark. have to buy it. So all I had to do was frame it. And it's from Uncle Marty. Yeah. Claire's Uncle Marty, um, yeah. who was a very famous priest in Minnesota. Um, when he passed, uh, he had already arranged that everyone had got to everyone in his family, which was quite a few people. 38 to, nieces and nephews and spouses. They got to pick one piece. So I picked that which is an, a pen and ink drawing of his original carriage house. He lived there. Amazing. And Claire picked that. <laughs> I don't know Claire, what we're saying. Claire mentioned whimsy before. <laughs> uh, we do, we try to have a sense of whimsy in just about every room. Um, I think one of the reasons that we work so well together is that one of the principles we live by is you can't take yourself too seriously. That's true. So we don't. We don't. We try. And, we try. That's right. We're a horse family. So Paul's side of the family, they were into racing still, his sister still is, and one horse won the Kentucky Derby. So amazing. My side is more family horses in the backyard riding you know, through the woods bareback. That's my story. So this was a Christmas gift from Paul's cousin John, Sasha, who's going to have that someday. That's her dad. And I thought it was just a perfect gift. So it's horseshoes. And they're coasters, and we use them all the time. So now I'm going to take you from the living room through the foyer into our dining room, which is directly before me. It was really important to Paul because we have such a big extended family that we have table service for 12. And so that's what we have. And I didn't want to have 12 chairs around the table. So I found this 17th century bench in Sheffield, Massachusetts at Cupboards and Roses, but it was too small and it wouldn't really serve any purpose and it was a million dollars. So I took the picture to Paul and I said, can I have that as a bench 
so that we can have seating for 12, but it breaks it up a little and it carries the Gustavian theme into the room. So that's what he did. We have Claremont leather on the chair seats. These are from Country House Antiques in Montecito. I wanted this room to feel very gardeny, and so I took a book that I got at the New York Botanic Garden um, antique garden sale that they have every year and tore it apart and my friend Barbara Bellin came and she watercolored in, these are all antique French gardens, and she watercolored them for us because I didn't know what to do with this wall. It was this huge wall and it just was empty for a while. So that's what we did with this wall. Again for the garden feel, this is hand painted English wall paper from Farrow and Ball that just carries the flower theme through. And this is my pride and joy. This is a milestone birthday gift from Paul that his sister Gail helped him find because I wanted, what is her name, Aunt Violet yeah, from Violet. Downton Abbey? Violet. I wanted Aunt Violet's silver tea service from Downton Abbey. And so this is darn close to the actual one. And it's my pride and joy. I live from the 1860s. It's British and I love it. The Dowager Countess. The Dowager Countess. Table and chairs, Ruby Beats in Sag Harbor. So the colors are very soft and subtle and natural in the house by design. But the idea is that the flowers and the people and the children and the toys, and they provide the life and the light. I just wanted to show you um, a few of these plates because I'm not usually a huge color person, but I do muted colors and then I add things in that are really special. So whether it's beautiful flowers for a Christmas party or whether it's what I'm wearing or in this case it's the plate. So when they're set on the table, it really lightens the room and makes it very whimsical. So these are called play plates. They're from Laboratorio Paravenici in Milan. And if you spin them, Paul says if I was on the Ed Sullivan show, I could spin them. But since I'm not, I'll, you'll have to imagine. But these are birds and there are horses jumping over horses jumping over jumps. I don't know if you can see those. And there are little girls, little girls on a swing. So they're very lively and playful. And these cups are completely separate. These are from my favorite restaurant in LA called the Ivy. And this is what they have on all the tables and I'm obsessed. So I just have a few here to remind me of home. And that's why there's color in the cabinet. It was, it was a long, hard process. So I always Four encourage years. young people not to give up. So we looked for four, four, years. four years and um, we made a list, each one of like what our fundamentals were. And I never thought that would be possible. And finally, we just, we couldn't find it. So I just gave up and started decorating the house that we had, which was in a beautiful neighborhood, but it wasn't my style. And um, then Paul found this house like a week later. And then we, we worked on it and we played with it and we doubled the size, and, but we tried to keep the character. Our village, Rosalind Estates, Paul's the mayor, is a very storybook, which was originally designed by Dean Alvord, who's very famous for really beautiful um, housing, it's, it's a development, believe it or not. I didn't realize that, but it was founded in 1933 something, or something, yeah. yeah. But this house was from 1926. And so here we are, and we finally, it's finally complete. It took about five years to really finish the house. The, the main thing that each of us had, uh, Claire had wanted a water view, and I wanted a front porch. Um, among, we also wanted a large kitchen family room. We wanted a place, basically, where we could have family and friends over all the time enough bedrooms that people could sleep over, family, friends could stay, family could stay. Um, so when I saw the listing for this, was the, one of the photos was a view from the living room looking out the, over the front porch to the water, to the pond down there. Um, I said, that's it, and we got it. And everybody said, he's never gonna move. He's ne you know, cause it was later in life for both of us. But he said, if I find the right house, I will. And now we're in the kitchen, and really every detail designed by Paul. He took my, I wanted a stable barn feel. We've talked about horses. So the, ki the old kitchen ended here, and we wanted a family room, breakfast room, everybody together space. And so we added on from there on out. 
in addition to the stable horse feel for the farmhouse, I also wanted people to come in here and feel like it was a candy kitchen or their favorite bakery or just a really special fun place where treats were allowed. So that's what this room is about. These are French lollipops I got from Copper Beach via France um, out in Belport. This pantry, because we didn't have a pantry and I cook all the time and we have a lot of people. So this is an eight inch deep shallow pantry that runs the length of the wall. And I said to Paul, I can't live here if this is all just wood and there's no light coming through so he worked and he worked and he worked like up late till two o'clock in the morning i don't know how many nights and made this happen so it's light above with a skylight beyond and our powder room below and then this i just mirrored it so it would feel like windows even though it's not so now i'm taking you into the breakfast room from the kitchen and i don't set the table like this every morning for breakfast it would be nice if i did but with these are where we have our really casual family meals and this is how i would do the table if it was a, if it was an elegant dinner and everybody seems this farmhouse table i found from jason home on first dibs bought it sight unseen it took three years to find because you can't find a table from the 1840s in France that's this wide. Because in those days, the women served and the men were seated and were served, and therefore, there was only enough room for one person for the depth, if that makes any sense. So it was really hard to find, but finally, 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 I did. And I think it's my favorite piece in the house. When I'm decorating or designing something that is like very intuitive to me is I'll start with something new and the, or I'll start with something old and then I'll want to go the other way and then back again. So this is the obviously the old table, new placemats, crate and barrel plates. I think this is circle lighting, but these are antique Cristoffel French silver and antique wine glasses that I bought in an antique store in Locust Valley. <laughs> and I know it shouldn't say Evian, but I love the shape of these bottles. And so I just think they're really elongated and elegant and they take a single bloom. So that is how I did the table. The first word that comes to me is peace. And when our son Adam wrote us a Christmas card the first year we moved into this house, it was the most beautiful card. I'll find it for you if you want, but it was about how this house is peace and tranquility and he said and every day is Christmas at the farmhouse which just meant success to me. Uh, at family because I, I love people in our generation at this time are usually downsizing and we upsized because we want people to be here. We moved in it'll be eight years this October and that first October the next month Thanksgiving we had 30 people here almost all of them from Minnesota and there were 10 kids running around. Uh, Jamie went to Toys R Us the, year, the, the day before and bought a dozen Nerf rifles and a couple of hundred Nerf darts. And they were having, and people were running around. Everybody stayed over. Every bedroom was filled. Uh, and it was wonderful. That's the happiest, one of the happiest days we've had here. Claire talked about our, our different styles. Um, it's absolutely true. If, I had, if it had been just me by myself, I would have lived in a Frank Lloyd Wright home with all built-ins. This would never have been my idea. And yet, this is exactly what it came to be, this home. This, this makes it a home. It doesn't feel like some sort of showroom or a commercial space. Hopefully not. And we yeah. use every room, which is also another thing I also wanted to. And the kids are so respectful. If you ask them to use a coaster, they do. They're adorable. And they run around and they give each other tours and they, so they feel like it's their house too. So if you remember from earlier, we said that we divided up the house because we both have strong opinions. And so one of Paul's rooms is the family room and that's where you're going next. And one of the pride and joys he's going to tell you about is his father's Eames chair. Okay. The, uh, one, of the, one of our goals in building this house was, uh, and, and enlarging it, was bringing the family room close to the kitchen, so we, which is where we spend most of the time. So, but we also didn't want it to overpower the kitchen. So it's, it's down three steps. It also means that that way Claire doesn't have to look at the ugly sectional couch that I wanted because I like everybody gathered together to watch an old movie. <laughs> we have this big sectional couch with two recliners, one on each end, that, uh, where we can all gather together, watch movies and laugh and stuff like that. Uh, one of the features is this terrible old Eames chair, which is about, uh, must be about 60 years old now. 
Uh, it was my dad's. He, used to, he went through a whole bunch of chairs trying to find something to be comfortable in, and he never was. So he tried this for a few months, hated it, and gave it to me. I had it with me in college. Uh, my, my roommate, uh, Max, and I, my best friend, um, we would share times listening to it. Whoever got back to the room first determined whether it was the Beatles or opera, which would be Max. Uh, it's taped. It's uh, worn, but it's still comfortable. One of the great features of the family room is this this uh, display on the wall, which is actually a piece of a church wall uh, from the 1800s. It lists, it's a very, just a portion of it, it lists some of the contributors to the, to the church. If you look at the dates, 1812, 1854, 1855, Claire and, and my sister uh, Gail were in London at the, uh, this warehouse sale. What was the name of the dealer, honey? How London. How London. Um, so she's, she found this, it was just sort of on the side there. And she called me about it, and so I'm standing on the, the couch here, measuring back, measuring the whole thing with a tape measure to see if it's going to fit, and it turned out it fit perfectly. So we, uh, we brought it back, and our, our, one of our friends, the carpenter, put a big um, uh, wood uh, cleat on the back of the wall, on the wall, and on the, and on the back of the, uh, uh, the piece, which was already framed. It, that's exactly the way it was in the, in, at, at the Howe uh, warehouse and it was shipped in the container with all the other stuff that they, all the other treasures that they found together. I'm a, I'm a model train fanatic, and I have a large collection of post-war Lionel trains. And one of the deals we had when making this our home was that the boxes that showed up on a regular basis would not be accumulating anywhere in the house, so we built a, a museum downstairs uh, to display the model trains, the Lionel trains. And I'm gonna take it down there now. There we go. My interest in trains came from when I was three and a half, and my dad took me on a fan trip uh, up the Hudson River on the New York Central. And I was from Grand Central Terminal, and just, it was amazing. Plus, the first two trips we took to Florida were from Penn Station, a beautiful, wonderful, original Penn Station. And we took, it was a 25-hour ride, and I think I spent the whole time at the window looking at the tracks on the parallel track and the, the countryside rushing by and the sounds of the bells as we go through a grade crossing. Uh, and then when I was four years old for Christmas, my dad got me a, my first Lionel train set and it grew from there. Uh, he would set it up every Christmas uh, in the apartment in Queens. And then when we moved to Manhasset, um, he had some guys come in that were recommended by the Lionel Corporation come in and build a big operating layout for, us in the, for me in the basement. Every Christmas and birthday, I'd get more trains from family uh, and from mom and dad. And um, it just grew. Then when I went to college, we gave it all away. Big mistake. It disappeared, never showed up where it was supposed to be. But I had made a list uh, for my dad of everything that we had for, so he could get a tax deduction on the donation. Uh, so I had that list and I said, I'm going to get everything on this list. A few years later, I tried to decide I was going to get everything I originally had on the list. And then I decided after that, that I was just going to get everything. Um, so that's what I've done. And over the years, I've gone to train shows. I've gotten bought uh, privately from, from people who are selling their, their trains. Uh, as a baby boomer, we all had these. That's not, you know, most of those baby boomers now are, are passing on. So their collections become available. Um, so I, finally, I wanted a place to finally display it properly instead of having it in boxes all over the place. So that's what I did. So this is basically all post-war Lionel, post-war from 1945 through 1969, the post-war era. And they're, they're arranged in, uh, by category. These are gondolas over here, boxcars over here. It may look like there's 20 of the same piece, but they're all slightly different variations. Lionel is a toy company and their production methods, sometimes they changed over the course of a year or two when they were making additional runs. So as a collector, those kinds of variations, like the variations in color, rivet detail and stuff like that, uh, are important to us. Um, and I wanted a way, as I said, to display them properly, that people could see them easily, and I could see them easily, without having to continually dust them. So I designed these cabinets, and our, our cabinet maker manufactured them. He thought he was going to be, he says, you can't possibly fill all these cabinets, can you? Well, I did. Right now we're under the garage. Like I said, they're arranged by category. Here we have cabooses and more boxcars. 
passenger cars. I'm, I'm sure to your audience, it's not going to be fascinating as to what the variations are, but when classic toy trains came through here, the guy was having an orgasm. I'll show you the favorite one. It's actually a, a, a train station. It's over here. This is, this is a work in progress over here. This station right here. When uh, Lionel was about to make a new item uh, for, their, for their product line, they would usually make a model of it first, a model of the model, a pan made, to see if it was going to sell, and they would display it at Toy Fair, and if they got enough orders from distributors, then they would make it. Well, this is a wooden model of this plastic station that was in the Lionel line for a long time, starting in 1949. When they first built their new showroom layout in 1949, this plastic one wasn't ready, so they put the wooden mock-up on the layout. And this is that wooden mock-up. This is essentially priceless. If you can see the variation, you can see that the handmade one had the, the chimney on the end, whereas the production model had the chimney on the side. So this is this piece is it right that's right there. And this is the photograph from the 1949 display layout in their headquarters. So that's what makes this this one special. This is probably my favorite one. Favorite piece. So now I'm going to take you outside to the apple orchard. Here's our wraparound porch and it wraps. There's a little dining area in the back there if you can see it. This was added by Mrs. Block who bought the house. Gosh, I don't know when she bought the house, but she was the second owner and we're the third owner. Um, we added this pergola here and we added this whole cottage, which is my design studio. So I work upstairs. And we, Paul loves English gardens, so this is our English garden. And there's three espalier in the back, which we bought at Martyrs Nursery out in Bridgehampton. And they're Asian pears. Then this driveway, I wanted gravel. He didn't because of the snow, which we don't have anymore. So we compromised. Our architect had this outside his offices and we fell in love with it, even though it's a little tricky to keep it going every year because the, the cement expands and contracts with the weather. But this way we have it feel like a country lane. And then th we added an orchard here. It's a small one. It's eight, and excuse me, it's six apple trees. There's macoon and there's green apple. And that bench and those chairs are from my very favorite garden store called Munder Skiles. It's up in Garrison, New York. So whenever I get to buy garden furniture, I always buy it from them. We added this also just to kind of define the space. Then there's a little forest and then there's the pond beyond. So we kept, we had some landscape designers that tried to talk us into moving this driveway and having it go straight up the right hand side so as to have a more complete space. But we loved the originality of it so much so that we wanted to define it further with the split rail fence. What I wanted was a wild American meadow here, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. So we just did grass and I try to let it get long sometimes. And if there's wildflowers, I let them grow. We don't have any right now. But here we are. So this feels like a country lane, I'm hoping. And then um, these chairs are from Munder Skiles. I love them. They are so comfortable and you can move them around depending upon the weather and the day and the sunshine. Our son Adam sometimes just comes and takes a break and I just see him out here on those chairs. And then this is our English, my attempt at an English garden. And this sundial is from 1840. It's French. Um, and I bought it at my favorite antique store in Montecito, California, because that's where I'm from. Um, country house antiques. So we had that sent from Montecito. And what's great about buying things from out of state is there's no tax so it pays for the shipping and here we're a horse family did I mention I don't know if you can get this but the cupola has a wind vane that I bought um, at an antique store in California again and it has a horse overlooking all of the property and so that just makes me happy because it makes me think of my horse smooth as brandy so we like the wild feel um, these are lambs ears we planted just little tiny ones last year and look how big they are. And then I love boxwood to sort of define the space within the wild. I, Ina Garten taught me how to do that. So these little ones here, just make sure that when the delivery cup trucks come running around, they don't run over my English garden. And we have roses and we have limelight and we have butterfly bushes. Do you see the butterflies landing? So they get so happy when the purple flowers come out. And then behind is our espalier. 
And in the back, we have a little deck off of the back of the farmhouse and my really dear friend Gianna called it the Espalier Cafe. So that's back there. Maybe we'll get to that later today. Um, and that's it. So hydrangeas, summer grasses. There are some blueberry plants back there, but you can't see them. The birds eat everything. I had a bumper crop of apples, all gone. <laughs> the birds and the squirrels took everything, but that's okay. These are crepe myrtles, and I think those are beautiful too. Um, yeah, we have bunnies usually scampering around, but that's later in the day, generally not this time of day. It's too warm for them. This is the other part of the beautiful garden. It's about an acre, and this is the exterior of the farmhouse. And then as you walk down, there was a pair of botany professors that first owned this house back in 1926. And they planted the mature landscaping that you see. Principally on the left are white pines that are probably now almost 100 years old. So we have a forest and we have a pond with the two aerators, um, which you get to hear almost all day long. I don't know if you can see it. And these are wild iris that bloom at different points during the, during the year. And our son Adam bought koi fish and turtles and he had them all Federal Express to the house. And then poor Norma, our housekeeper, would panic because she loves anything alive. So she'd take the box and come running down here and throw them in the water and we never saw them again. So I, it's terrible. I hope, I hope everybody survived, <laughs> but I don't know what happened. We meant well. So this is the town of Roslyn Estates. A lot of people don't, I didn't, even know this pocket is here. And what's so unique about it, I wanted to be in the country, Paul wanted to be closer to this city. So this was a miracle for our family because you can jump on the train and be in the city in 30 minutes or by car, 45. Um, but here you are, it almost feels like you're in the country. So it's a really special place and we're so grateful that we found it. I just wanted to tell you about these amazing trees. They're called rosebud trees, and in the spring, they are the second ones to bloom after the daffodils, and it's vibrant, vibrant purple. Amazing. And there's another one up there close to the house. So I just wanted to tell you about these ta this table and chair. So you, you heard me talk about Munder Skiles before. So John Danzer is the founder of that company, and he didn't feel about 20 years ago that we had beautiful English outdoor garden furniture that lasted. So he, um, I wouldn't say he necessarily designed everything himself, but he found British prototypes from the past and rebuilt them and uh, made a, he bought a teak farm. So it's all sustainable. You don't have to paint it. I can just do a dinner party here on the fly and it's perfect and ready to go, no matter how many years I've had it. So I really love these chairs and table. Okay, so now I'm gonna take you upstairs. This is again a rug and kiln runner, which I love because it carries in all the sand and the creams and the topes of our scheme. And this is a picture of the four of us at our uh, beach house in West Hampton. So welcome to our bedroom. This is, um, the idea was to feel as serene and to wake up with beautiful morning light and to sort of emphasize the sunshine quality that comes in through this window and that early in the morning. So this is Tallow by Pharaoh and Ball. And this is a really special piece. Once again, Paul came to the rescue. This was a picture of an antique that I had been carrying around for, must have been, I'm not kidding, 20 years. And I said, you know, I would love this cabinet to hide our TV and to give us some extra storage. And so there were dimensions on the bottom of that photograph. And he was able to draw it and make it to our specifications and was built by a mill worker here in town. This is one of my very favorite fabrics in the world. It's Robert Kime. It's called Oxen, O-X-A-N. And I just absolutely love it. But we always laugh because we can't agree on the headboard. So here I am, a designer, and Paul, an engineer, and we have, I think the little boy was nine years old. <laughs> That's his headboard. And we like it for functional reasons. So until we can come up with something better, that's what we have. So the real genius in this room was the configuration of the primary bath. So I'm going to ask Paul to come in and talk us through that. Honey, will you come and talk about the bathroom? Sure. 
Originally, the uh, master bath was in that closet. It was kind of tiny, and this was their only closet in the room, and this was their sitting room. So we wanted a bathroom that we could both use together. Um, we're not shy that way. So we took the, uh, uh, their sitting room and turned it into the master bath. But in order to do that, we had to re re uh, rebuild the entire floor, which is the, the uh, ceiling of the music room, because the rafters were basically just nailed into the header, and we don't even know how to support the floor, much less a tub full of water. Uh, it would have been water. the money pit. Yeah, it would have been the money pit. So we, re we ripped out the, uh, the floor and re-engineered it uh, using uh, micro lamps. And uh, so we made it a generous bathroom, got a tub for Claire and a shower for both of us. And then the two farm sinks. And the, and the, uh, the two sinks. The, uh, the countertop was low because of the uh, windows. So we, uh, that's why the sinks are surface mounted. Uh, and we wanted to get all the stuff off the countertop. So we have our huge medicine cabinet over here that holds all the stuff and underneath as well. And it's a painted floor as most of the, as many of the floors are because it's easier to repaint than restain. We have our best conversations in the bathroom. That's right. <laughs> we sure do. It's also a separate heating system, as a matter of fact, so that this can be warm while the bedroom is cold. And that's Tony. Tony the Toad. Our first date was after about six months of uh, eHarmony, where you go from uh, answering questions, filling out forms, <laughs> then communicating through their server, then doing regular emails, then exchanging phone numbers, and finally actually making plans to meet. Uh, and it was June 24th. It was a Sunday afternoon. We met at uh, Da Silvano. We were meeting there just for a drink. Um, we stayed for lunch. Um, then we walked around uh, Soho, uh, went to the Apple store. We'll tell you that story. And um, we came back to the same area and went to a comedy club. It was turned into a wonderful whole day date. And then, uh, and that was it. Uh, I knew, Claire knew. Um, she was very formal, which is so funny for Paul, the navy blazer and the whole, you know, and I thought, well, let's just get through this. <laughs> I really did. And then he leaned across the table after 45 minutes and said, so are you staying or are you going? And I thought, okay, he's funny. And that was, that was, we were together really pretty much ever since then. Why'd you go to the Apple store on your first date? Well, uh. let's see, um, we, we were in Soho and um, I forget what, why we just, we're just walking around and looking in the Apple store. Remember that was 17 years ago. It was still fairly new. It was pretty ex exciting at the time. And then, um, we were looking at the different products, and Claire told me that she didn't have an iPod. Now, at that point, everybody had, they don't make them anymore, but everybody had an iPod. You have to have an iPod. How can you not have an iPod? So she decided, all right, I'll get an iPod. So I paid for it, because I couldn't, I, forced, I felt uncomfortable having forced her. Would have, he was I had, mortified, that, that and was I a, was mortified. We were all mortified. So it was a, li <laughs> a lime, metallic lime green iPod, and, um, so I paid for it, as my father would have insisted. Um, and then all my friends referred to him as iPod Man, yes. like until they met him. How could you buy her? A, he bought you an iPod on the first yeah. date. What's yeah. wrong with him? Yeah. One of the many things I found out was wrong with me. So this is my sitting room. That I always believe in an upstairs sitting room or living room if you can possibly figure it out because that way there's somewhere else for the family to gather privately if there's a big event going on downstairs so we created this from a little guest bedroom originally the room had a little slit window up here and this is the, the roof of the porch so uh, it was strong enough to support it so i opened it up with french doors and built a little veranda out there where you can sit it overlooks the pond and uh, and the patio below uh, so it's, it's great in the mornings on a, a nice spring morning to have a cup of coffee out there or whatever. And it also brings, as Claire loves to do, bring the outside into the house. As That's much one as of the, possible. one of the driving uh, forces in, in the design is to bring out the outside in. And then the fabric is, this is paper-backed fabric. This is Indian print from Les Indiennes. And then we paper-backed it and hung it as though it was wallpaper because I wanted it to feel like the inside of a hat box. So I don't know if you noticed that the floor is pink, but that's just kind of a little fun 
thing that we have. And then these 1950s Terence Conran tables were found um, in Battersea in London. These Regency chairs, same from my favorite um, Christopher Howe, Howe London Antiques. Um, this sofa is all Lays Indian fabric. Paul designed this chaise for me. And this is a beautiful Gustavian, carrying the Gustavian theme through, um, a beautiful secretary, again, from Leaf Antiques in LA. And the, these are all family photos. This is my dad and his brother, and my dad grew up to be a naval pilot in Korea. So that's really special to me with his little brother, Uncle Pete, who sadly passed away. Um, this is our son, Jamie. This is my wedding day. This is um, some dear cousins of ours and my mom and my uncle Jim who just passed away at the age of 93 and he will be sorely missed. This is, I couldn't figure out what to put on this wall because it's such an active room but I felt that it needed something so this is, I'm sort of obsessed with Africa. Paul took me there five years ago which is the trip of a lifetime and this is an African, it's called a juju, it's actually an African crown and so that's what that is. I found it in pink and hung it on the wall. So this is my sitting room, so it's a really special place, and I come here in the mornings and think about family, and so this is my dear stepson, Adam, our eldest. It's an example of marital harmony. It is Paul wanted this bathroom to be more old-fashioned and less modern than our other ones, and so he wanted a clawfoot tub. I was on board with that. What I was not on board with was a shower curtain. And finally I said, okay, this is nuts, but what if we set it inside of walk-in shower doors? And he said, let's do it. So, here it is. And Paul, honey, do you want to say anything about that? Only that about uh, two years later, Kohler had it in their catalog. <laughs> That's true. A tub in a shower. He, they That's thought it was true. great. The house originally had steam heat converted to hot water going through ridiculously large pipes. So we had to rip that whole system out and convert to forced air. Um, but Claire loves the look of these old radiators, so we kept three of them. They're in the original locations. They just don't work. They're just sitting here and they we had them sandblasted, cleaned, and uh, painted and polished up and there you go. They don't do anything, but they look cool. So there's a third floor, it's the attic. And we have a bunch of nieces and nephews, all of varying ages. And so the two in particular were eight and 12 when we bought this house. And now, of course, they're in high school and college. And we have kids' rooms, but we're keeping them. This is all their art that they've made for us over the years. Every Christmas and birthday, I, it would be such a special uh, treasured gift would be a piece of art from them. Um, so then I just wanted you to quickly see the upstairs bedrooms. So this is one. And this is a... We designed this bed and then this here pulls out. There's another mattress under here. It pulls out and then it can rise and be a queen size bed or a king size bed or it can just sleep too. And then there's one more this way. And this is, two, we call this the bunny room and the bunny bath. So this is fabric that I love. This is CNC. It's from Italy. This is Rug and Killam, an antique Moroccan rug. This is a really special piece from John Darien from Antwerp. These are John Darien lamps. Lays Indian fabric. I had those headboards custom made. And these are Hugo Guinness pen and ink. Because Bunny always taught me that you want children to grow up with sophistication and art so it's childlike but not childish. So this is my attempt to honor what she taught me. This is the bunny bathroom, carrying forth the theme from the bedroom. Um, Hunt Slonan is a favorite artist of mine, and so this is a wall covering I found um, that reflects his work uh, from Lee Jofa. So we just decided to paper the upstairs bathroom, and we all call it the bunny bath. Home, home to me means family. It means being able to have your, your family and your, and your friends, your special friends over um, and have them feel at home as well. Uh, and we have that. As a matter of fact, um, 
uh, Claire's dear friend Susan, uh, coming into the driveway once, uh, said it was she was like coming into it was it coming into a dream. Well, she said she said she was. It, they had driven from the Hamptons late at night. We were having cocktails here for them, and she said she drove in and she felt like a little child, like oh I'm home. And so that was one of the best compliments we've ever received. Home to me means. Well, I think I've tried to express it non-verbally in what it feels like when you come in. And I know that might be hard for anyone who's, you're all invited, by the way, <laughs> you wanna come. So, it's, so it is family, but to me that's expressed by family antiques or family photos, or for me the most valuable piece is not any piece of furniture, it's, it's, an, it's a professional photo of a moment in our lives or someone else's. That's everything and you'll see that throughout the house. On today's episode of Homeworthy, you're in for a real treat because one of our favorite hosts is back. You remember designer Darren Hennell from his New York City Homeworthy episode. When we walked in here, Michael was like, where's the apartment, where's the apartment? And then we walked in here and Michael still kept saying, where's the apartment, where's the apartment? Because he kept thinking it was the foyer of the building still. And it's not, it's our living room. He sometimes splurges on the small stuff. There's one thing, my husband does not know this to this day. We've been here for 14 years. So there's a trim store called um, Samuel and Sons. And it's where I take all my clients and I buy trim. I buy things for edging, um, drapery and tassels and tie backs and little details on chairs. And I've been working with the same salesperson there for 25 years, Janice. Janice, I love you. Super talented woman. So I walk in there, these are new, I put these up. I walk in there and I had a little trim that I was gonna use and it was discontinued. And Janice was like, oh, I know what you're gonna do. You're gonna take this in blue and you're gonna take this in terracotta and you're gonna overlay them and you're gonna use them together and then you're gonna put this braid on top of it. It was $10,000 for the trim on those gardens. And literally to this day, I'm still like, how did I spend $10,000 on trim for, but it was a moment. We had just moved in and I was feeling like, I'm moving into a mansion on Fifth Avenue. I should have $10,000 trim. Total, total stupid move. But he's always the consummate host. Nothing's too precious to have the dog on it. Nothing's too precious to have a child on it. People would be like, oh, I just had a baby. And we're like, come for the weekend. I have cribs, I've got a changing table. You don't create a house for it to be a set. You create a house to actually live in and for your friends to enjoy with you. So I don't, I don't understand the whole idea of wrapping your furniture in plastic and having cushions that look perfect all the time. That's, that's not my shtick. And today we're taking you inside this stunning Kip Bay show house in Dallas, Texas, where Darren has transformed a nondescript space into a luxurious bedroom and bathroom. Wrapped in a beautiful hand-painted silk wallpaper, he used mismatched antiques and lots of layers to create a warm and inviting room that you'll never want to leave. Enjoy! You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Be sure to visit our website, homeworthy.com, to discover amazing furniture, art, accessories, and more, all handpicked by our editors to help transform your house into a home. All of the items are inspired by the episodes you see here on Homeworthy. Enjoy! Hi, my name is Darren Henault. I have a design firm called Darren Henault Interiors in New York. We're at Kips Bay in Dallas, and I was given the opportunity to design one of the guest rooms and a guest bath that's adjoining. So the interesting thing about Kips Bay is historically, when it's been in New York, they ask somebody to take a house that's for sale off the market. So the reason there's always been a very short period of time that you had to get it done really, really quickly was for that reason exactly. I'm not quite sure why they still do it on that ridiculous time frame, but they still do it on that ridiculous time frame. So we get invited the end of August to participate. They assign the rooms. Um, I'm not from here, so the whole thing was just done via photographs. Um, and then immediately, 
I start calling people, vendors that I've used for years and seeing who's willing to participate. Now here's what's interesting. I originally wasn't gonna do the Kip Space Show House because I feel like, ugh, I'm old, I've done show houses, I've been around the block, I don't need to do this. Everybody that I called and asked about Dallas consistently said it is their biggest market in the country. Every vendor said have whatever and everything you'd like because it is the biggest market in the country. These ladies like to decorate and they like to decorate big. And the other thing somebody said to me is I looked at old photos of the past four years and there were some young kids doing funky things and I called my friend Jamie Drake, who's a great decorator, who's a, a mentor to me. And Jamie said, absolutely not. He said, you do what you do, which is old fashioned, high end decorating. So I have to tell you, I was thrilled when you all said you were gonna come and cover this because I sort of feel like, you know, sometimes you get interviewed by people and it's the first time and you're like, oh God, how's this gonna go? Their questions are gonna be really mundane. But you all, you've done, you might remember me, uh, Homeworthy interviewed me in my country house in Millbrook. Homeworthy interviewed me in my city house um, in New York. Um, and I loved it. I thought it was a great experience. I thought you did an amazing job of making me sound smart, which is not always easy. Um, and, I, you know, it's, so, it's sort of like coming home. Oh, look at that, coming home. Homeworthy, get it? That's good. So, yes, you might remember me like whispering about how much the trim in my room costs. And I, I fully admit that that was a, a moment of complete hysteria on my part. Um, I can't say that this trim is $10,000. An interesting thing is um, the Shade Store was a sponsor for the house. I'm used to working with workrooms that are really amazing with detail and more like dress couturiers, couturiers than they are workrooms. And so I asked, the shade store, all these questions. I was like, when you do the leading edge, do you hand stitch it? And they said, yes. When you do the hem, is it a blind stitch? Yes. So th they were fun to work with. And the great thing about Count and Tad is they have miles and miles of trim. And so they let me put it on absolutely everything. The other genius thing is I don't have to pay for it. So I have no idea how much any of it costs. I do know that the Gracie fabric although not obscene, is not inexpensive. So when the show house is over, we have to turn this back into a white box. And these are coming home because this is going to be a pair of pants. It's going to be a jacket. It might be a little hat. I'm not quite sure what it's going to be, but I'll be wearing this walking down Fifth Avenue at some point. The process is you get a white box. You've got less than 12 weeks to design it, find all the vendors, put it together, do construction because you literally have to move electricity. I had to move plumbing in the bathrooms. I moved a wall because I didn't like how small the bathroom was. Um, I had to find a contractor down here in Dallas um, and a local designer was incredibly helpful in that. Dallas, everybody has been so friendly. Look, New York's lovely and the design community is really supportive of, of each other and they're very generous. Dallas takes it to a whole new level. I mean, these people were just so thrilled to have everybody and anybody participate that they've all been really lovely and really kind. So I did, I, I, I hired a local um, architect and he helped me um, survey the room. So I had drawings to work with remotely. I walked into um, Fromental, which is the maker of this wallpaper. It's all hand painted on silk. Immediately they said, sure, you can take that. I then went into Gracie and Gracie's now making their wall patterns. They started digitally printing them on fabric. So this is sort of one of the first presentations of this fabric in the country for them. So they were really excited to participate. And then finally, I walked into Counten and Tout, um, which has several brands under their header, um, and literally in 20 minutes chose the rest of the fabrics for the room. It, it's, it's, I, I've been doing this for a long time. It's a pretty quick process. You know, it's funny. Everybody asks the question, what's your inspiration? 
And I would love to say that there was a thing, like I heard a Joni Mitchell song, and that was, and, and that's sort of not how it works for me. It's the space. It's the, I don't, I, I hate a tray ceiling. Like a tray, this room has a tray ceiling. And a tray ceiling to me screams 80s, spec house, bad architecture. So immediately I knew I was going to make the ceiling look tented. Now, interesting, because I happen to have my own brand called Tent, um, but it sort of started from there. I knew the room, I knew the ceiling was going to be tented, I knew it was gonna be upholstered, and so we then just pulled all of the texture down from that starting point. So here's a little tour of the room. So I, as I mentioned, we started with the ceiling, then this is the Fromental wallpaper. This is silk, and it's all hand-painted. Ordinarily, it also would have been embellished with hand embroidery, but they didn't have enough time to get that thing done. Um, this is something that I designed. This is part of my furniture collection. I originally designed it for my kitchen so that I could sit here with my kids while my husband cooks. Um, but then remembered my husband hates when people are in the kitchen when he's cooking, so we never got to sit on the stupid thing. Um, this fixture, this light fixture, Ages ago, I found a foundry in Florence that had all the molds for a sculpture called Tofinari from the 1940s. And he'd done nothing with the sculptures because they're all a little odd and weird. So I created a line of furniture, and this is one of the pieces. It's a lamp. It's available at Maison Girard on 10th Street in New York. Um, and then this, like, because you got to add a little more when you can add a little more. This is brush fringe that ordinarily would either be down or would be on a pillow, and we used it so it was pushing up to give it a little height. Um, you know, was this necessary? Nobody here in Dallas knows me. I, th I thought I'd throw some personal photographs here, A, because it gives a little color as to who I am, and maybe people would feel like they had a little more intimacy with me in terms of hiring me to design their houses. Um, but also, it makes it feel like a room. It makes it feel like a proper room in a proper house, not just a show house, not just a showroom. Because that's, I, I don't like rooms that are cold. It, things have to be fully worked out and, and, and really cozy. The rug, um, is actually from my rug collection, from my store tent. This is a Lavar Kerman. Um, it's a beautiful rug. And weirdly, I called the warehouse and said, I need a Lavar Kerman. I need it to be this size. And one of the warehouse guys called back and he said, I literally have what you want, six inches short on each side. So it's as though it was made for the room. It's, it's pretty brilliant. This is a sculptress that's in California. Um, I love her work. I love how organic it is. I think it's really beautiful against the background of the Gracie. I think it's really spectacular against the background of this. I love that it's a modern feature in a room that's otherwise relatively traditional. And then something that sort of happened organically that I wasn't really doing on purpose is these lamps. I had asked that woman to make lamps for the store as well. And so I had these in the store, and they're the same material. They're a white plaster. And then I needed a ceiling fixture, and it just seemed to me like I should keep going with that theme and have a connection that sort of wrapped both sides of the room. So that's another plaster fixture. That's from Liz O'Brien in New York. The upholstered pieces are, are my, from my collection. They're, they're sold at Tent. Um, and again, you know, ordinarily there'd be a massive tea cushion on this if this were coming out of some lousy factory. And instead, I, I keep the pillows sort of light so the seat is really deep and it's super comfortable. You don't need this decorative pillow here, but it's a show house and, you know, we added it. On the chaise, same thing. The scale of the chairs, um, the length. Literally, it was very important to me that a tall or short person, one could sit this way with their legs this way, and somebody could sit that way with their legs this way, and it's intimate, but you're not on top of each other. So you don't feel like 
you're cramped into a single chair. It really feels like the super luxurious chaise. So yeah, scales, super important. I also, you know, you'll notice this is on the diagonal. I, I do this all the time. I, I can't stand when furniture hugs a wall too tightly. Like no piece of furniture should be closer than two inches from a wall. Like a piece of furniture has its own life. It should be able to breathe. Um, and I, I just think putting this on the diagonal made it more dynamic. And speaking of placement, the, uh, so often you walk into a bedroom and there'll be a desk, but the desk will be facing the window. And so you have your back to the room and you're not actually experiencing the room while you're working at the desk or it'll have the back to the window. So you're looking at the room if you put it perpendicular to the window, you get the whole experience. You get the ability to look outside, you get the ability to see the room and enjoy the room. So for the antiques in the room, I didn't really want to ship a ton of stuff down from the people I usually work with in New York. So I went on first dibs and I just scoured Dallas for pieces that I was interested in. And luckily I found this pair of chest of drawers and when I called the guys, like, I'm really sorry, they're not a matching pair. I was like, perfect, I don't want them to be a matching pair. Like, they're so much better not matching. And it sort of gives the feeling that one's female, one's male. Not that you can't have two men living in this house, but it, 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 I love a mismatched pair. I think a mismatched pair is great. This, this is a textile from Jack Leonard Larson. Jack Leonard Larson was very influenced by Asian textiles. And I, I love the way, uh, I didn't purposely create sort of an Asian theme, but you know, the Chinese pattern on the windows from Gracie, this from Jack Leonard Larson, the weeping willow walls, it all sort of comes together. People often say, God, you're amazing at putting things together. And can I tell you the truth? It's sort of something that happens in the back of my mind. It's not always something that happens intentionally. I pull things and my eye is just putting things together and the back of my brain is connecting them. And it really isn't until they're all laid out that I start to see the connections. It's, it's rarely that intentional. I don't like thematic rooms, so it's rarely that intentional. And then just one final thing about this is this is a company, I walked into a store on the left bank of Paris 20 years ago called Galerie de Lampe, and they made the most beautiful light fixtures. And luckily they're now represented in the United States by I think Ayatesta in Dallas um, and John Roselli in New York. Um, and I, 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 there, I don't know, there's this sort of architectural weird mechanic vibe to them that's very 19th century, which I, I just relate to. I, I think works incredibly well with all of my work. Honestly, I purposely displayed a bunch of books on the ottoman at the foot of the bed so that people aren't just throwing their clothes all over the, uh, the ottoman. Um, you know, frankly, I'd rather they threw their clothes on the floor than on the ottoman. Um, I just find if you use this, if it's a flat piece and you use it more as a coffee table, then people are less likely to just continually throw things all over, throw their clothes as they're getting undressed at night. One thing I want to point out about this is, this is actually a vertical pattern. This is a series of stripes, embroidered stripes on a fabric from Cowton. And I just cut one layer out and use that as a skirt on the ottoman. So as a foil to all of this prettiness, all of this elegance, I hung a piece of art by a woman named Anne Harris. Now Anne Harris historically did um, uh, decorative painting on walls for and created entire rooms and she you know wanted to do something a little different so she started doing these paintings and this is one of a parrot claw which I thought was really cool and I actually moved this wall to make the bathroom bigger but I moved it exactly so that that piece of art would fit then these closets we mirrored the closets because I wanted to make sure that it created a double image of the claw coming back at itself. And then additionally, I also wanted to make sure that if somebody was in the room and at that angle, 
they saw the reflection of the bathroom to make sure they were drawn into the bathroom. So for the bathroom, I worked with artistic tile. Um, I don't think bathrooms should be a cacophony of color. You're gonna be naked and there's a lot of mirrors, so you're gonna be seeing all this color behind you. I do not wanna look at greens, purples, oranges behind me when I'm naked. I want something relatively neutral. So this is Arabiscata. It's a relatively neutral uh, stone, but it has a fair amount of movement to it, so it creates a beautiful pattern. So you'll notice I used that material, but in different textures. So we've got the groove, we've got the um, slab, and then I cut that grooved tile to create the baseboard, to create the casing around the window, and then finally to create the um, crown in the room. And then the floor was chosen to be polar opposite of the walls, to give it a really grounded feeling. It's got what's called a leather finish, which is super, super textured, great for not slipping on. Um, and I, I just think it's a really beautiful contrast to how subtle the walls are. And then finally, just to add a little bit of jewelry, that same Arabiscato comes as a, um, here, step into my shower, comes as a um, mosaic. And the mosaic gives you the benefit of lots of traction on the floor so you really won't slip. But then I kept it going up the wall and I did it on the ceiling just to give it a little bit more glitz without going too far over the top. What I love most about my room is I did the installation and then I called my husband and Michael uh, and he said, how do you feel? How, 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 how do you feel about it? And I said, honestly, it's a room we would live in because it's, it's layered and textured. Look, I never want somebody to walk into a room that I've done and go, wow, that to me is, that means I didn't do my job. That means it's too flat, two dimensional, doesn't work. If I've done my job, you need to sit in that room and be in that space for 10, 15 minutes minimally before you've really started to absorb what's happening because there's so many layers, there's so much texture. Um, hopefully the furniture layout is dynamic and incredibly useful and creates various places to sit in one space. So it's a multi-purpose room. Every room should be a multi-purpose room. Today on Homeworthy, we're taking you to Belport, New York for a look inside interior designer Chris Benz's gorgeous Victorian shingled home and grounds. Chris has masterfully transformed each space, working with the home's original layout to create cozy, inviting nooks. With a background as a designer for J. Crew, Chris brings the same layered and effortless sensibility to his home design as he does to fashion, adding cool accessories that make each room uniquely his own. He takes us outside to introduce us to his chickens before giving us a tour of his beautifully restored gardens. Enjoy! You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. By clicking the join button below, you not only support the production of these videos, you also gain access to exclusive content just for members, including an inside look today into Chris's collected guest cottage that is filled with fabulous treasures. Join today to see more of the homes you love. Hey Homeworthy, welcome to my farmhouse in Belport, New York. I'm Chris Benz. I can't wait to show you around. Come on in. Hey everyone, I'm Chris Benz. Welcome to my home in Brookhaven Hamlet, New York. Um, we're here in my entryway. It is a Victorian farmhouse that I've spent about the past five years renovating and you'll get to see 
pretty much every single room as we do a little walk and talk, some of my favorite pieces from each room and talk about the journey of picking colors, um, shopping for furniture and the renovation process um, over um, many years of collecting and picking all of my favorite pieces. So when I first arrived at this house, you can imagine it probably did not look like this and you would be right. It was a total 80s renovation, drop ceilings, hi-hat lights. I had to back out of so many things. And my process was really about figuring out what the house should look like and probably what it did look like uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s when it was first built. So I had always dreamt of having a weekend house as so many people who live in Manhattan and in the city always do after many years, you're like, oh my gosh, I have to get out of the city on the weekends. I just can't take it anymore. So I would spend hours and hours looking for old houses. I looked everywhere. I looked upstate. I looked um, in Long Island, of course, and I drove everywhere and looked at so many houses. I looked at stone houses in Woodstock. I looked, you know, all the way. I was like, oh my God, I found an amazing house in Albany. And people were like, uh, you're not driving to Albany on the weekends. Like you are crazy. Um, but I ended up finding this house that had really fallen into a little bit of disrepair. Um, it has amazing gardens, but when I first arrived, you know, they had um, really kind of become overgrown and the hedges, you know, had grown many feet beyond what they should have been and were falling over and um, it sort of languished on the market. But I was up for the challenge. So um, you'll see what we did. So part of my job as a decorator is to find a balance between what people love, push them into new uncharted territory and find a balance of what is exciting, what's comfortable um, and create harmony in every space. So oftentimes when you have to do it for yourself um, and particularly for myself, it's constantly changing and it's even more difficult because I love so many different things. Um, but in this house, um, come to find out, um, it was originally built as a boarding house. So a lot of the rooms didn't really speak to uh, sort of the original use that would become, or that would be obvious uh, when you go into an ordinary house. This is a dining room, this is a living room, this is the grand entry hall that you're supposed to be impressing the neighbors with when you have them over for you know, a Christmas party. Um, there was a lot of unusual spaces. So we're in the entryway right now, which is actually really small for a house of this scale. And when you think about the original use of the house, it was rental, small bedrooms upstairs, and then sort of larger common spaces downstairs. And it was for uh, people who were on their way eastward, sailors, whalers. Um, you know, the trains had just um, made their way eastward on Long Island at the end of the 19th century. And um, it was a place for people to literally stay overnight, get a hot meal, play cards, and then be on their way. Um, so in this little entryway, I kind of um, just made it feel cozy and welcoming. And one of the things that I used as kind of a roadmap for the color story are these original um, early, 20th century maps of the neighborhood. So I have um, the town of Brookhaven, um, a neighborhood map of our little part of Bellport of Suffolk County, and then part of Brookhaven down here. Um, but as you can see, if you look closely, kind of the trim color and the wall color all pull from kind of the faded and patina of these original antique maps. Um, which I think is a really good trick when you're picking palettes for old houses is find something old that you love and build the palette off of that, um, that one item. It'll feel authentic and really special. So something that's followed me for a while um, that I have in my collection is this Ernest Trova marble sculpture. It is very unwieldy to move um, and it is from the mid 20th century. Uh, he was a sculptor. He actually designed the CFDA um, award and he did a few of these large scale sculptures. Um, I've moved it a couple times. I hope to never move it again. <laughs> and um, now it lives here. So it scares people away from the front door, which I love. 
Um, and I love that it feels kind of modern and idiosyncratic in this kind of old house. Um, and I love the idea always of adding like one element that feels unexpected. Um, oftentimes in an old house, when you start to add antiques and layers and old things, it goes into that territory of feeling very traditional and you always need something to kind of pull it out of that. And, uh, you know, something bold like this really does that exact thing and helps it feel kind of um, the tension um, that's necessary. So one of the things that was very important to me in renovating was keeping as much of the original trim and detail as possible and the spirit of the house. I am not sentimental about painting original details, but I am very into keeping the original details in terms of the spirit of them. So um, all the original pocket doors were intact, which was amazing. Thinking about the idea that this was a, um, a sort of functioning, um, a sort of hotel type structure where they would be able to kind of close off and partition different rooms um, was really interesting. And I loved the functionality of that and kind of maintaining that uh, felt really important. Um, and again, I love the idea of uh, painting everything in a way that felt modern, but keeping all the detail feeling very traditional. So this is Mushu. He's my one-year-old Chow Chow, the star of um, the house. He'll be popping in and out as we go for the tour. So off the entryway, we have the front living room. Let's take a look. So here we are in the front living room of my house. This was probably the common area of the boarding house. And I really wanted to keep it feeling like sunny and bright and casual. I definitely did not want anything feeling formal or fussy in this room. Um, one of the things that I learned when I started to decorate the room was that everything was shrunken down. Um, all of the spaces between the windows, between the door and the wall, everything was small. So I actually couldn't use a lot of modern furniture because it was simply too big. Um, and that was good for a couple of reasons. It was cost effective because I could really only buy vintage furniture and antique furniture um, at auction, um, you know, auction sites um, and vintage stores and flea markets, which was super fun. Um, and uh, and also it was it enabled me to kind of mix and match and pull from a bunch of different periods. I basically committed to this corner being my base camp during COVID and lived my Victorian lifestyle with a little drop front East Lake desk and probably lived a parallel life with someone who did the same thing a hundred years ago in this corner, um, which I thought was sort of funny. One of the things that we did um, in renovating this room was, uh, lift the ceiling. All of the ceilings were dropped and had really big can lights from the 80s, which I'm sure kept it very bright, <laughs> you know, 40 years ago. But I really wanted it to feel authentic and true to the time period of the house. So um, one of the beams that you see existed structurally, one did not. So we added a, um, a matching beam and then added all of the beadboard to the ceilings um, so that uh, we created this sort of balance in the room, um, you know, and then replicated all of the original crown molding. So um, it sort of gave the feeling of this little bit of, um, uh, you know, detail and um, craftsmanship that was missing um, in such a big, bright front room. Um, and then in committing to the sort of um, you know, airiness. I had this gigantic sisal rug made and then really wanted to commit to this, you know, the airy kind of casual feel. So everything has a hand woven sort of tassely tattered feel. The muslin chairs that are sort of undone and, you know, the little bit of a raw feeling on the rug and the pillows, the mid-century canvas painting that has no frame. That was kind of the theme of this room. Uh, another of my discoveries during COVID was that 
some of the most beautiful bird cages in the world are made in Croatia. And I commissioned this bird cage to be made for uh, canaries, which I ordered to be my COVID friends, and two of which you can see here, they're red factor canaries. Um, and they sing beautifully. I think everyone should get canaries. They're so charming. Um, and I just love this birdcage. It was um, such a special addition to the room and it become, or it sort of became this sculptural element and really suits the spirit of the room, I think. So one of the things I always say about decorating is that if there's something that you love, it will always work in your space. And to that end, something that has followed me for many years is this vintage disco ball that I bought at the old Chelsea Flea Market at 26th Street, which I'm sure some of you will remember. It is long gone, but I have lugged this thing around through many apartments and many houses, and no matter what the decorating scheme has been, it has always worked. And people have always loved it. It has always looked great, and it looks great in this room. I don't know what it is. It's a Victorian farmhouse. The room is somewhat traditional, and that disco ball looks totally appropriate in it. So if you love something, put it in your room and it will look perfect. One of my best tips for decorating a room is really putting up guardrails on what you're buying and find a very neutral baseline, sandy, flaxy neutrals, chocolate brown, some kind of neutral palette, and then pick one pop color or two pop colors and only buy things in that palette. Then maybe add one more color, layer in a few other things, but always have that neutral base palette and the room will always look great. I am a very novice art collector and probably buy the totally wrong things and I only buy what I like, which inevitably is probably definitely the wrong things. But um, this is a <laughs> Tom Sachs Kelly bag, which here I can take the... Um, the thing off so that you can see it a little better. When I was a student at Parsons, um, we always carried the Klein canvas tool bag with all of our like scissors and colored pencils and everything. And um, the artist Tom Sachs did a version of that and he replicated an Hermes bag with, you know, the lock and everything and the chain. And it's called the Tom Sachs Kelly bag. So he issued, I don't know, you know, a few of them and I bought it as part of my art collection, which I think is so charming and funny. So it's a little nod to my days as a Parsons student. Um, but I think it's so charming. So off the living room, we have the library. Let's check it out. And welcome to the library. So for this room, I sort of did a lot of the same renovations that I did in the front living room and uh, installed beadboard ceiling. Um, I actually painted it a really bright yellow because I just felt like consolidating a lot of the color, um, particularly with the paint in this house. It gets a lot of light, so I felt like doubling down on the light in this room and the color felt like the right direction. Um, it gets a lot of morning light, so uh, it felt really like keeping it as cheerful as possible was um, kind of what the room wanted. And to that end, like I said, really bright yellow ceiling, this fantastic Danish modern lantern. Uh, again, when you're shopping for vintage light fixtures, vintage furniture, it doesn't have to be on the nose. Obviously this is a Victorian house, but this is a mid-century light fixture, but it still has the spirit of a Victorian lantern. So it still works in the context of the house. And I just love the color of the glass. And it's not like you would find that in a Victorian light fixture necessarily. Um, so in addition to all of those bright colors, um, adding in some bright upholstery, some bright side tables, just keeping all of these um, really vibrant elements contained into one room. Um, keeps up the guardrails of design um, all into a sort of safe space <laughs> for me in this one room. And um, that's what keeps it really um, successful, I think. Um, again, grounding the space with this really severe East Lake bookcase kind of lends the authenticity of reminding you that we're in a Victorian house with that really nice ebonized finish. Um, and then again, 
twisting it a little bit. Um, one of my other collections, which I've been amassing for a while, are these really cool um, Italian uh, ceramics. Um, they pop up every once in a while at auction, and obviously you can find them at flea markets all over the place. But you know, when you group all of your collections into one big uh, kind of mass, it becomes sculptural and really impactful. So I'm always looking for places to do that, and I love kind of how that looks with the bookcase. So one of my design tricks, which is often overlooked and actually was developed over obligation, when I was a student and I had like two pennies, I found this trunk on the street because in the city, obviously, people are throwing things out all the time and it became the coffee table in my first apartment. And look, it's still a coffee table in my house today. And it is awesome. I feel like people always overlook steamer trunks as a piece of furniture and they always look great. Um, I love the old hotel stickers on them um, and the travel stickers. And it's amazing storage. You keep all of the stuff that you don't want to see or, you know, holiday decorations or whatever inside um, when you don't need them day to day. Um, so it's just an amazing element and um, you should use it. You know, I kind of used this painting as inspiration for the room and that felt like the roadmap for all of the pieces uh, that went into this room. But again, the sort of beige was the foundation, the wall color, and then that created the kind of background for all of the highlights of the, of the uh, bright colors. And I think that's what makes the room work, um, is kind of that paper bag brown. Um, and then everything else becomes an accessory. So I think that that is always important. This sofa is Ralph Lauren. I bought it at auction. Someone upholstered it at one time in this silk velvet. And I think I know why they got rid of it because it's impossible to take care of, but it is beautiful. I love chocolate brown. It came with four pillows, which weirdly was not enough because it's like not functional. But then six pillows is actually too much. So if anyone has any ideas about how to fix this, um, Everyone always comments that there's too many pillows, but actually it's exactly the right amount. Don't be alarmed. Obviously, Bellport is a seaside community. We can't not have boats in our decor. Uh, I love this. It's an actual, like a pond boat, they call them. They're, they um, People would sail them um, in the early 20th century on ponds. Um, and I don't know how they would get them back once they send them out on the pond, but now this one safely lives on top of the bookcase in this room. This is a Ming Aurelia tree that used to live in Brooklyn, and it made its way here to this house and is, seems to be happy in this corner. I love um, an interesting, unusual house plant. I am not great at keeping them alive, but somehow um, this one has really fought me um, <laughs> and, uh, and stayed alive for um, about 10 years so far. So it's winning the battle. Um, and I just think it's, you know, having some kind of life. It's like the canaries, the trees, like, you know, it's good to have things that are living in your space, you know, to sort of create a little bit of responsibility beyond just furniture and things. So I started my career in fashion. <laughs> I attended Parsons School of Design. I loved fashion. I loved magazines. Growing up, I could not wait to move to New York and be in the fashion world. And I just loved everything about it. I loved fashion shows. I loved clothes. I still love clothes. And uh, it was really the thing that I loved most in the world. And I started my career at Marc Jacobs. I was an intern. I was the intern that would not leave. I interned at Marc Jacobs, I think, my entire time as a student. Um, and it was just the best. Um, you know, the most beautiful fabrics, the most beautiful buttons, and just seeing fashion in real life was a dream. Um, and when I graduated, I went to work at J. Crew. And that I always felt like was my graduate school from uh, Parsons because it was really about American sportswear kind of on the mass level. And, you know, how 
how to make clothes that really sell to a huge amount of people. And that was so fascinating to me, kind of understanding how, uh, how the business of fashion works. Um, and then after um, that stint at J. Crew, I was able to launch my own line of women's wear, which was um, very exciting. I had my first fashion show. Um, we staged it at Christie's Auction House, um, which was in 2007. And um, a very small little women's collection, but, um, you know, very beautiful, just great, colorful sportswear, you know, like this room. It was very special, um, you know, jackets and dresses that you could wear um, back to everything you love, a t-shirt and jeans. Um, and uh, did that for quite some time um, before going back to um, J. Crew and um, leading the women's and children's line for a number of years before making the big transition um, to uh, decorating and design, which is what I do now for my own company um, uh, and working for a lot of the people that I made clothes for with my own line who are now um, buying houses and apartments that need to be renovated and decorated. So it's a lot of full circle um, moments um, for me in my career, but it's been very special and I still get to enjoy fashion for myself and, you know, enjoy color and fabric and all of those things in a totally new way working in the home world. The transition from fashion into home was totally natural. I mean, it's solving all of the same problems. Putting an outfit together is exactly the same as putting a room together. It's proportion, color, texture, detail, accessories. It's all of the same elements of design, just in a totally different context. And in a lot of ways, feels very refreshing. Well, let's go look at the rest of the house. There's tons more to see. Welcome to the dining room. So this room probably got the most ceiling work of any of the rooms downstairs. It actually had one of the lowest ceilings of the downstairs rooms and the biggest can lights I think I've ever seen. And in being thoughtful to the idea of a Victorian farmhouse and the idea of a dining room, we raised the ceiling and installed this coffered ceiling with beadboard going in all different directions. So um, when you have dinner parties and things, it has this really interesting feel, um, especially with candlelight. Um, and it has a little bit more grandeur than, uh, than the other rooms and feels very special. A great find um, from our little auction house in town uh, in Bellport is this curio cabinet, which is just amazing. If you don't have a curio cabinet, you have to get one immediately. Um, you can put all of your weird little things in here and it keeps anyone with a little bit of a hoarder mentality really organized. I put everything in here. There's pictures, old pictures of my mom when she was a kid. There's special plates. Um, there, I always collect um, local um, antique uh, postcards and old like travel brochures from Bellport. Look, sometimes the chickens lay like they're called fairy eggs like the miniature eggs. So I just keep them in here um, and they dry out. Um, and I just think it looks great. Whenever we're doing dinner parties or cocktail parties, people just love to come and look at all the little um, trinkets and special things um, in here. So again, I love throwing in one modern element, especially in a traditional interior. And in the dining room, I have this huge Milo Bothman dining table. I think there's, I don't know, five or six leaves. This right now has none of the leaves put in and it still seats six people. Um, but it just looks great in here. It really balances out all of the Victorian and kind of antique furniture and really grounds the space in feeling not too traditional. So I paired it with these, I guess these are Klismos chairs, but in any case, these ebonized antique chairs and it just looks fantastic. I use it sometimes as a desk. I can like, you know, 
put all of my work out on it and it's really functional. And then if I have to have a big dinner party like Thanksgiving or something, I can extend it all the way into the library and seat, you know, 15 people at it if I need to. And I just love it so much. Another of the collections that I started when I was renovating this house was antique portraits. And at first glance, people might think it was a little cliche, but there is a little bit of a tongue in cheek element to them. And the context or the filter with which I try to buy these portraits is that there's something messed up or weird about them. So if you look at each one individually, you'll see there's like something off-putting about them in general. Like she's like quite beautiful. She has kind of interesting talisman, but there's sort of a green sickly hue to what's going on there. And she's sort of, I don't know what's going on here. So she's sort of creepy, haunted, haunted house looking. Then these two guys, I mean, we could start with his funny fur coat. He sort of looks like he could be a clown out of makeup or something. I don't know. There's a circusy element happening. And then he's, you know, shirtless, you know, uh, sort of has a 70s vibe happening. So, you know, there's something weird about all of the portraits. It's not just, a, you know, a straightforward antique portrait. So that is, that's my criteria for the antique portraits. And I have quite a few more of them actually. Um, and I like to rotate them for variation. All right, let's go check out the kitchen. And here we are in the kitchen. So this was the original working kitchen of the boarding house. And to that end, there's this massive pocket door, which you can divide the entire house off from the kitchen, which is very interesting. Um, there is the original um, working fireplace, which is actually the cooking fireplace. Now we just keep like silver platters and stuff in here, although it does work. I've never cooked on it. Um, but people love the idea that you could have a fireplace in the kitchen. But this is, I guess, how they would cook everything for the boarders. I did a big renovation in this kitchen, although you probably never know it because it pretty much looks exactly how it would have looked when the house was built. The original beadboard walls, we took everything off and then put everything back on. Um, the cabinets, we took everything out and then resized everything to accommodate for like a new refrigerator, a new stove, and then put everything back in. Um, remade all of the cabinet doors, resourced the original hinges, and then put everything back. Um, and then I knew that I wanted a really special marble. This is Opera Dart marble from France, but I wanted to keep everything feeling really casual. There is like something very casual about the house. And although I felt like a stone counter did not feel appropriate for the house, this particular marble, I felt because of its kind of undulating colors, um, felt a little bit like um, beach stones. And that to me felt very appropriate to the house. Um, and the colors also spoke to, I think a lot of the colors in the house. So um, that's where we landed with that. I love a big kitchen island, but unfortunately, because of the proportion of the working kitchen being so narrow, we really couldn't have a proper kitchen island. So I sourced this game table um, just so that we could have something to lean against, chit chat while people are cooking. And it really gets a lot of use, as you can see. It's a great table. So one of the things that I love about this house is that it functions in totally different ways depending on the season. During the summer, I'm almost never inside because the yard and the gardens are so beautiful and there's so much work to do. I'm almost always outside. Plus, we have a beautiful porch, which basically becomes the outdoor living room during the summer. So we'll go look at the porch in a second, but I want to show you some pieces from my china collection first. So we have these fabulous built-in um, cabinets and they just fit these blue and white pieces so perfectly. Um, I bought most of them at auction, um, but look at how great. Um, I use them all the time. And someone was like, oh, they're too beautiful. You can't use those. And I'm like, well, 
what are you supposed to use? I hate the idea that you have China and you don't use it. It's like, ugh, I can't imagine not using what you love. So who knows? We just use it. We haven't had any casualties yet, but I mean, if something happens, you just, what are you gonna do? And welcome to the porch. So the porch is very special. It is basically the summer living room. It's divided, it's big enough to be divided into a big dining area and also a very gracious and beautiful kind of living area. And it truly is an outdoor living room. Um, everyone is pretty much outside the entire season. And um, there's a beautiful seagrass rug on this side and a beautiful seagrass rug on this side. Um, when I first moved to the house, there was this amazing stick rattan furniture here. Um, which only lasted about one season and totally fell apart. So I became insane about finding a replacement set and I finally did. So this is the replacement set, um, but I wanted it to be identical to what would have been original to the house because it was, I was told, um, original to the house. Um, so it made it all the way up until I bought the house. Um, and now hopefully this set will make it another, you know, 100 years. Um, we shall see. But um, I just love it out here. We put up the lanterns, you know, it's great at night. The view is so beautiful, just looking out at the gardens. Um, and uh, of course the dog loves being out here, um, watching the chickens and <laughs> the deer run by um, all day. Luckily, the screen porch was in pretty great condition when we moved in. Um, there was only one little light bulb hanging from a wire, so I replaced that with a fan, replaced some of the lighting, um, but all in all, it was in um, pretty spectacular condition. So besides kind of um, brushing up with the furnishings and um, doing a little paint, um, it was one of the lightest touch renovation spaces that I had to do. So I love an accessory coming from the fashion world and um, obviously pillows are the ultimate accessory um, in the home world. And these Joseph Frank pillows make me crazy. I could not decide on what print I liked the most. So I pretty much bought one of each or actually a couple of each print. Um, and I figured out that the best arrangement when you're mixing prints with pillows is to group them together. So don't just mix all the prints together, put the like prints together and then, you know, so that there's some kind of order um, and that always looks the best. So um, that's how I did it on the couches and it ends up looking a little bit more logical uh, if you have them at least grouped together with a little bit of order. Well, it's an absolutely beautiful day. So I don't know if you can hear it, but the chickens are desperate to be let out and poke around the garden. So let's go let them out and we'll look at the gardens for ourselves. Okay. Well, it is a beautiful day here in Belport and I'm a little late letting the chickens out. So they are not so happy, come this way. So I built the chicken coop while we were renovating the house. And I figured while the carpenters were here, why not have them just build a chicken coop? And there was an old, I don't know, tree house or something that was falling down on this location. So we basically just replaced the tree house with this chicken coop. And everyone said it was an outrageous chicken castle, but I think it's the perfect size for 10 little chickens. All right, girls, come on out. I know, I know, come on. Come on out. Come on out. <laughs> come on out. So none of them have names. And this is the combination of two flocks. And um, half of them started out 
commuting as weekend chickens from Brooklyn. And we would come back and forth. Uh, and then the other half I got while we were out here. So there's 10 total. And now they live in harmony together. My fantasy of getting the chickens was that I would have all different colored eggs, which is exactly what has happened. And they lay so many eggs that I give them away to everyone that will take them. And they lay all different colors and all different sizes, come to find out. Um, but we have green, chocolate brown, little pink eggs. Um, it's really charming. And... Um, it's really fun and charming. And this time of year, they lay so many, you like don't even know what to do. Um, it's like outrageous. Like, look at these girls. I mean, they are like desperate. Look at all these eggs. Ah. I mean, they are so funny. It's never not outrageous to come out here and like get eggs out of the coop. So now that we've let the chickens out to roam, let's go check out the garden and see what's in bloom. The property did not look like this when I came to first look at it. It was totally ramshackly and crazy. Like any stone that you see it was not here before. This tree I put in, these hedges were basically sticks. Um, the, nothing looked like this. And anything that looks like it's overgrown right now is by design. This uh, is technically called a parterre, which um, would be a kitchen garden, a cutting garden. Um, People use it traditionally for a few different uh, reasons. I basically shove anything into it which will grow and come back uh, year after year, um, which has taken a few seasons to figure out what those species are. Um, and then periodically I'll pop in a few different things like herbs or anything that I think is pretty at the nursery. Um, but. Uh, I figured out what kind of pops up every year and what will keep going. We also have a terrible deer issue in this whole area. I think it's actually considered an invasion or an epidemic. I forget exactly what the term is, but they eat pretty much everything. So anything that you see here are things that deer, I guess, do not eat. Um, in any case, um, the astilbe, the purple and the white just started blooming, which looks so nice. Um, it's a cool time of the summer because everything starts to get really like blousey and kind of like relaxed. Um, the springtime, you know, everything's like very crisp and bright and um, you know, everything's like perfectly in bloom. And now everything kind of gets like a little weedy and um, you know, I think it's a little more casual and cool. Um, when I bought the house, there used to be this big um, crumbling concrete urn in the center, um, which after a couple seasons actually did crumble and turn to sand, basically. Um, so I installed this. It's um, uh, It came from, uh, I think, South Carolina. It's a sugar um, bowl, and it's the uh, sort of like distilled sugar uh, in it. And um, now we made it into a fire pit. So um, in the summer, sometimes we'll have a cocktail party or something and we'll light a big fire in it. And it's so dramatic um, and looks so great. Um, I think it looks so cool. And uh, let's see, um, there's lots of peonies in here. They're done blooming. The grasses sort of hop up and they look great. This is Joe Pie weed. Um, it's a native. It's really going wild this year. Cool. Bleeding hearts, they're done. Some sedums, very cute. Yeah, everything's really like becoming very frothy. All the magnolias are blooming really nicely this year too. Southern magnolias. Um, and a lot of what was really special about this yard too was all of the layers of hedges. 
Um, this whole parterre garden is bordered by a boxwood hedge and then behind it is a privet hedge. Um, and then at each of the four corners are Alberta spruce, um, which are really fantastic looking. Um, you know, there's a level of formality to the garden that kind of creates structure. And then within that, this kind of very casual nature, which is interesting. Um, and then just beyond the parterre, just sort of a hidden gem um, is the pool back here. So there is a little bit of structure and formality around the pool with these four sort of very specific plantings on each side, but they're allowed to kind of get blousey and frothy um, to kind of add to that casual nature. So I think it's like quite charming. Oh, this is just the little lounge area. Um, and <laughs> this is a Hollywood prop, which now I'm stuck with after buying for a Halloween party. It floats in the pool. So now it lives here by the pool. <laughs> and it really scares the landscapers. Another little special thing on the property is this beautiful tree house. The chickens love it. Some of them go up in it. They like to take little dust baths underneath it. Um, but it's such a magical little thing. Anytime kids visit, they like to like go up there and just hang out. It's like only pretty much accessible by children. The hatch is like <laughs> this big, um, but it's amazing. It was built by a local craftsman, you know, years ago, and it's really stood the test of time. Let's head upstairs and check out the bedroom. Okay, so welcome to my bedroom. Um, like I said, since this was a boarding house, all of the bedrooms were very small and awkward. This is the biggest bedroom, albeit the most awkward of all of the bedrooms. So the bed actually had to float in the middle of the room. There's no orientation where a bed can actually be up against a wall, but that's fine. I made it work and picked a very nice sandy green for the walls of this room. And because it gets lots of morning light, um, it actually is a really beautiful neutral color um, and looks great throughout the day. Um, again, lots of furniture um, feels period appropriate. So I love an armoire. Uh, especially these faux bamboo pieces. Um, this is French um, from, I don't know, 20s or 30s. Um, it breaks down into a million pieces, which is how I got it up here, <laughs> the only way. Um, but coming from the fashion world, I obviously need lots of storage for clothes, and um, it was a necessity in a house like this with no closets. Um, and of course, um, with bedding, I love to play with color. And um, rather than buying all matching sheet sets, I like to buy all different like tonal colors of sheets. So like, I don't know, don't buy all one color of green, buy like all mixy matchy colors of green and then like one off color. So this is my like current arrangement is like blues and greens and one pink pillow. Um, that's my current summer colorway. So again, back to my collecting of weird portraits. Um, I have two. There's one here and one back here, both by uh, a Portuguese artist from the 30s called Ishmael Bla. Um, and this one I love, especially it's called The Witches. <laughs> and it's this lady and then all like spirit versions of herself like whispering in her ear and she's clutching a rosary. It's so creepy and funny um, that I bought at auction ages ago. And then um, there's another that's like a creepy old man with a pipe. Um, I don't know, they just really suit the spirit of the house, I think, and they look great. Who doesn't want creepy old portraits of people staring at you while you're in bed? So these windows don't overlook the flower gardens, but they do have a very beautiful view of all of the specimen trees um, to the uh, east. 
um, which is awesome. When you wake up in the morning, you just see like all of these very beautiful trees, um, which is so magical, um, making up for all those years of looking out at brick walls in Manhattan. So this was the original sleeping porch, um, which has since been converted um, into an interior space and now a little desk area, which is so nice. I like to take zooms here, which is like lots of natural light. Um, and you sort of feel like you're in like, I don't know, like Captain Sandy or something on below deck, like you're in the bridge, um, you know, sort of on like a cruise ship or something. You can see like everything. Um, but it's so nice. I have my desk here and, uh, you know, it's like, what a, what a different view from, you know, all of those days working in the city. And a highlight of this space is these clerestory windows, which are all original to the house in um, all of these kooky colors. Um, again, so beautiful. And you can see where I pulled some of the colors for some of the rooms um, from some of the original colors of stained glass. Home to me means a place where you're surrounded by all the things that you love and that bring you joy. So here's to being at home. Thanks Homeworthy for coming to visit me at my home. Now you gotta go, get out of here. Thanks for watching. Go to homeworthy.com for exclusive content and shopping guides.